Okay, in this video, I'd like to continue on with my tutorial series on electrostatics. This is video number two, and I'm going to discuss the electric field. I'd like to draw your attention to my website, universityphysicstories.com. Also, if you follow me at Twitter at AdamBT503, I'll be able to post news and updates about the video tutorials which I'm doing. So, the video previous to this was number one, or the first video tutorial in this series, where I discussed Coulomb's Law. And that's the we'll say and that's the first point or the first place to start when you're talking about the electric field. So I said in um, I said in the video on Coulomb's or Coulomb's law that we have things called source charges and I said we'll say we give a small letter Q for a source charge. And then we also said we'll the source charge is by definition we'll say what it uh, creates or it will say creates an electric field okay and I didn't say what an electric field is and then I said we could have this test charge cap capital Q and this tries to experiment or excuse me it tries to experience it tries to experience or measure or test the electric field and we found that when we applied Coulomb's law we had a force which was going the direction from the source charge to the test charge and it had a magnitude, we'll say that the force vector was 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0, the product of the charges divided by the separation vector squared and multiplied by the separation unit vector. So this is, uh, this is the separation vector like that. All right. Now, what we need to notice here is the source charge, in this case small q, is having an influence on the test charge big Q. Now, the question you need to kind of, or the, the what you need to get your your head around, is that there is, there how is this influence being transmitted or transferred? How is it that it's doing it? It's not, it's not like, for example, the the, the source charge has a hand and it's gripping the test charge. It's not doing it that way. It's not like it's shouting at it, so it's not. There's no sound. So how is it that the the source charge is able to have an influence on the test charge, in which the test charge can measure? And the answer is that we, I suppose, the the model which we're using is that the source charge Q, small Q, has what's known as an electric field associated with it. So the electric field goes from positive to negative. So this Q is positive, right? And the electric field is it is um, in the direction away from positive charge towards negative charge. Okay, it kind of points in that direction because the electric field has a direction, just like force does have a direction. And you might say, well, you know, is it is it an actual? Is it a real entity? Is it like? If I was living in, a, if I was on a, a pond, for example, and I wanted to have influence at some other point in the pond, well, what you do is you put your hand into the pond, or you splash something about, it, and you have waves which would propagate through the pond, and as a result, you'd have an influence someplace else. Now, the electric field, as far as we know, is not in fact like that. It does not require a medium. So, in the case of the pond, the water is your medium. But in the case of the electric field, it does not need a medium to propagate, and it can propagate through free space, or can exist, excuse me, in free space. So what we try to imagine is that there is this, we call it a field, I don't know how best, it's, it's obviously something that we're making up, uh, you know, it's a model that we're using. It's, so every electric charge has a field associated with it, and the field then is able to transfer any influence that your charge has on other charges. All right, or it's a measure of that, and it's through the field, it's through the field, we'll say E for the electric field, that the test charge capital Q is able to experience a force. So the electric field is causing the force to be experienced by uh, by capital Q, and the force, of course, is Coulomb's law. Now another way of looking at it is as follows: we started with Coulomb's law, and I said that Coulomb's law obeys the superposition principle. So the total force vector is the sum of the force, the other, the individual force vectors. So we'll say force one plus force two plus whatever, say force n. 
Or you could say it's the sum over n of the forces like that. Okay, and they're force vectors, of course. So let's look at this and let's, let's, let's go ahead and do it, right? So we have, let's say we have a series of individual point charges and these, they're, they're, there's single charges somewhere in space. And let's say they all have the same value of plus small q. So they're all the same source charge. And somewhere over here we have a single test charge, capital Q. And I want to work out what is the force experienced by capital Q due to the, this collection of source charges. Well, what we'll do is we'll uh, use the superposition principle. So I'm going to say that the total force is going to be equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. Then we're going to have, let's say, Q sub 1, capital Q, separation vector. Okay, so let's say it's the separation vector for 1, and we're going to have the separation unit vector, like that. All right, we're going to have to add 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 again. The second charge, the test charge, the separation vector for those two, or the, the magnitude of the separation vector for the two of them, and the separation unit vector for the two of them, and so on. And we can see, of course, that no matter how many test charges we add, we're going to have this common factor of 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0. So what we can say is we can factorize that out, and we have 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 outside of Q1, excuse me, put the Q up there as well because that's also common. So you have Q1 times the separation unit vector for the for between the first charge and the test charge. And we have that. We have Q2, the separation unit vector. And we have the separation unit, unit vector, we'll say the magnitude of it to be squared, and so on. I'll do one more. like that okay and that goes on or let's let's define a new quantity let's say that the force the total force is equal to Q outside of the electric field which is a vector or it's Q outside of the sum of 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q sub i or hat sub i divided by squiggle uh, sub i squared. And what we have here is our electric field. Okay, so this is more the mathematical way of looking at the electric field. Alright, so we call E in this case the electric field of the source charges. Notice that it's a function of position because, of course, squiggle is equal to r minus r prime. So this is the, 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 the vector from each of my source charges to the origin, and this is the vector from my origin to my test charge. All right? Uh, so it's a, it's a function of position, and but it makes no reference to the test charge in this case, q. It makes no reference to the test charge. So the electric field seems to be independent of the test charge, but it's only due to all the individual source charges, the q sub i, the small q sub i. All right? So physically what we'd say is the electric field is the force per unit charge that would be exerted on a test charge if you were to place it at a particular point. All right? So I don't really want to, um, I don't really want to, uh, get down into what really is a field because to be honest I think that's a very difficult question if you want to know more search for my video on uh, scientific models and perhaps that can explain more or my video on wave particle duality not because they will discuss the electric field but they will discuss models and the electric field is is, is some is a model that we're using uh, as far as I'm aware now the issue is that so far we've been talking about a would say it's a distributed collection of point charges but sometimes you will have something you have a continuous distribution of charge let's say for example you had a solid and your solid all your atoms are essentially linked together because they're so small and instead of having a summation and that's kind of that's generally what happens instead of having a summation sometimes we can go to the integral 
So where we have a continuous distribution of charges, we don't sum, we, rather, we use rather the integral. So what I'll define is as follows. There are three different ways you can have your continuous, uh, your continuous charge distribution. You can have it on a line, you can have it on a surface, or you can have it on a volume. So each one of these, is there, the, you're going to have a total charge. Let's say, I don't know, you're going to have a, a total charge, right? So let's say, it doesn't really matter. For the moment, it's going to give you capital Q, um, even though we are talking about source charges. But let's say my total charge is capital Q. And capital Q is the sum of the Q sub i's, like that, the sum of the individual charges. But the point here is that the individual charges are essentially continuously distributed, so we can use the uh, we can use an integral. So what we say is that Q is equal to the integral of uh, sorry, or we we say now that Q is e equal to the capital Q, the total charge, is the integral of dQ, or d small Q, we'll say. So in this case, what we're going to get, if it's on a line, it's going to be lambda, and we're going to have dL prime. And you might say, well, what's that? Well, lambda is the charge density, or linear charge density, and dL, of course, is because we're talking about a line. Now, what if you have a prime? We're talking about source charges, and as a result, we always use a prime. So for, for a surface, it's going to be sigma dA prime, so sigma is the surface charge density, and dA prime, of course, is our infinitesimal uh, area element. And for our volume, it's going to be the integral of um, rho d tau prime. So d tau is the uh, d tau prime is the infinitesimal volume element, but it's it's with respect to the source charges, and rho is the charge density inside our volume. So if we do that, then there are three different ways we can write. Well, in total, four different ways that we can write our um, we can write our electric field because initially when we make a continuous distribution of charges we had our electric field which I said was a function of the of the distance is equal to now by the way I'm going to say 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 I'm going to call that k and that, that's kind of a normal and um, that's a normal thing for people to do so it's going to be equal to k outside of the sum over n of we'll say i is equal to one q sub i squiggle hat sub i divided by squiggle squared. So that's for a distribution of point charges. Then if you're talking about instead of a distribution of point charges but maybe a light line of charges and they're all sufficiently close together, then what we're going to have instead is the integral where we're going to have k outside of the integral is going to be a path integral, of course. We want to have lambda a function of r prime, okay? Because we said prime variables are source charges, and that's exactly what we're, we're looking at here, because that's what the electric field is. We're going to have the separation unit vector. We're going to have dl prime, and we need to divide this, of course, by squiggle squared, which is the unit, the separation vector squared. If we're on a surface. If we're on a surface, the electric field, and it's a continuous charge distribution again, it's going to be the integral over the surface of um, sigma r prime, the separation unit vector, dA prime, divided by squiggle squared. Okay, and finally, if we have a continuous distribution of charge inside a volume, we're going to have the electric field at you know at a set at position R or associated with the the the, uh, the vector R is going to be the integral over the volume of rho of R prime and once again R prime for the sources the separation unit vector the tau prime divided by squiggle squared or the separation vector squared. So there are four different ways of writing the electric field. And they are very important because we'll be using each of those four. Actually, we'll be using these three more than the uh, the the collection of point charges, just because the collection of point charges is more difficult, and more often than not, we're actually able to talk about a continuous charge distribution. All right. So yeah, that's all I've got to say about that. Thanks for watching. Please pass it on to your friends. Subscribe to my channel, and you might also click on universityphysicstorials.com.